Welcome to Rising Earth News. I'm here today with Claire Nazir, meteorologist, author and broadcaster. Hi Claire. Hello there Lauren. First things first, please can you give us a general overview of the UK's extreme weather trends in recent years? Okay, we don't have to think very far back to realise the weather has gone from one extreme to another. I'll give you an example. April 2020, the sunniest April on record. Record amounts of sunshine rose to around 170% of average. Not only that, it was incredibly dry. Some parts of eastern England only saw 5% of its rainfall. If we go back to February 2020, it was actually one of the wettest on record. Uh, we saw a number of storms just batter the UK. Flooding was rife. And then the month before that, January 2020, was actually one of the warmest on record, the warmest January is on record, I think it was the fifth warning, warmest to uh, average temperature around six degrees Celsius. So every month we're talking about extremes in some shape or form. And if you think about April and now May, the weather has been so quiet, so settled, so bright. But from last August 2019 to February, we had some of the wettest weather in recorded history. So we're swinging from one extreme to another. And that's pretty much been how it has been for a few decades now, if not longer. And it really echoes what's happening around the world as well. So a new report that came out uh, today, that's the 7th of May, 2020. We've actually seen that the months of um, January, February, and March, are the second warmest globally on record. But not only that, if we think about March 2020 to March 2019, going back 12 years, they're joint first. So in the last five years, we've had the, some of the warmest heat on record, the highest temperatures on record. 2016 was the, the hottest year ever recorded and records go back to around 1884. Uh, however, there was an extra influence there, and that was El Nino, which adds on about a, a third of a degree of heat. El Nino is the warming of the Pacific, Eastern Pacific waters in the Southern Hemisphere, it has a knock-on effect globally. Now, last year was one of the warmest on record, and even though we had a wet start, it looks like 2020 is going to be, again, one of the warmest on record. And looking back at the records, back to the late 1800s, you had never seen anything like it before. I mean, the, the years where it's been warmest have been all in the last decade or so. So it's testament to what's actually happening when we talk about greenhouse gases, we talk about global temperatures rising and the impact it has on life on Earth. Yeah, of course. Um, and obviously you've been presenting the weather for a, for a long time. Do you, do you find it challenging to communicate complex weather patterns to the public in a, in a way that makes them feel engaged? And, and I guess the way that we present weather at the moment, you know, do you think that it's a constructive manner of teaching people what is really happening? I think there's two things to think about when we're talking about the weather. First of all, it's the short term weather scenarios. So sunny, dry, hot, cold, wet, mm -hmm. snowy, etc. And the impacts that have on a daily basis. And then there's the climatic against the climatic norms or averages. So I'll give you an example. Last summer, we saw some of the highest temperatures ever recorded in the UK. Even though it was day in, day out, the heat was building against the background of averages, it was much higher and people couldn't believe it. But people's lives were really impacted by that. Um, I'll give you an example of a heat wave which happened in 2003. In the UK alone, over 10 days, 2,000 people died. The heat wave which impacted Europe during the same time, around 70,000 people died. Obviously it's a bigger landmass, more people. So there are ways that you don't have to communicate this severity of weather when it's affecting people's lives. I think people can have short memories and when things go back to normal, like at the moment, the land is now a bit drier than it was, say, at the beginning of the year when it was sodden. The sun has really got to work and there's lots of evaporation in the atmosphere. But for those people who have lost their livelihoods because of the flooding, those people who lost their homes because of the flooding, that memory is etched now in history and it's going to be there for a lot longer. 
And because we're seeing more and more extreme weather events coming through, you know, month in, month out, then there's going to be more and more people who are going to be affected by that, whether it's heat waves or floods or strong winds. So I think there has been um, a change in people's attitudes in the last even decade. People understand now that, you know, we aren't immune to extreme weather. It is happening on our doorstep and it may not be as bad as, say, a cyclone hitting the shores of Bangladesh where hundreds of thousands of people lose their livelihoods and thousands lose their lives even so there has been some extreme conditions where it's really affected us here so i think there has been a sea change and i think that will continue to happen also i think people are un understand climate change much more than they did even 10 years ago i think public opinion is far more for government policy to produce policy that is conducive with a green new deal where we are using renewables where we're cutting down emissions and where we're thinking from a sustainable point of view rather than any other so i think there are difference in attitudes that that are now manifesting particularly with the younger generation and i guess building of that you know people becoming far more aware of climate change and its impact do you think that there is a link between people's behavior and extreme weather um, always, but I think, you know, on a sunny day, people just are celebrating the fact the sun's out. The weather in the UK changes every day. Well, every week or so, should I say. Um, and so we do, don't have ever a really, really long spell where we are desperate for a change in our weather. However, over the last few years, I've noticed a real trend in blocked weather patterns. So when we get one type of weather, it happens again and again and again, like a groundhog day for, for many, many months. And because of that, I think now we, are, we associate our weather patterns with being extreme more so than ever before. When we're reporting the weather and communicating the weather, the most important thing is, is it's protecting lives. It's telling people what's going to happen so they can make informed decisions about what to do, whether to go outside or not, whether to take warm clothing if they're walking the dog, take extra time on their journey. So all of these things, we're learning together as a nation really how to communicate the weather and, and, and live, adapt with our ever changing weather patterns. Mm. And, and I guess leading on from that, has the lockdown, you know, the COVID-19 lockdown affected the weather? You know, is, is there any correlation between people using less transport and the spike in renewable energy that we have just had? That's really interesting, actually. The report just out today talks about the amount of CO2 being pumped into the atmosphere right now and how it will have an effect on global carbon dioxide emissions over a year. And in fact, it's just a dip, really, more than anything. However, close to home, I think what we really noticed is how clear the air is, how brilliant blue the sky is. Obviously, that's helped by some sunshine. But the smell of pollutants in the air from, say, uh, roads, congested roads close by is not there. The skies are empty. They're normally full of aeroplanes and contrails. And all these things have really contributed to a much sweeter smell and sense of the outdoors. Even just the bird song is more, I would say, pronounced than it has been because you can hear it. And so all these things, I think, are just despite the fear, the anxiety, and the sadness associated with the pandemic, there are some cracks of light coming through the tunnel, and that's things like the air is definitely cleaner, people's lives are slower, and there is less congestion, people getting less stressed on the roads because they're not in their cars. So all of these things, I think, are lessons that we have to really take into the new normal, into post-lockdown and practice them as much as we can because we know now we can do it but we want to do it in such a way that also drives our economy so people have livelihoods rather than uh, living in a state of fear because they don't know where the next pay paycheck's coming from. Mm. And I guess just to make you elaborate on that point what is your take on a call to action after this pandemic? You know, what, what do you believe that people can take from this time that we've had during COVID-19 and the lockdown? Well, interestingly, a report that came out just a few weeks ago 
um, suggested that in the UK, public opinion is so fully behind renewable energy, up to, I think it's something like 82%, which is absolutely incredible. Wow. And there's been lots of news stories out there um, talking about how renewables have pretty much dominated the electricity generation mix. There's been an incredible spike in renewables and a sustained lack of coal. So I think we've had the no um, electricity generated by coal for something like three weeks now. And that's the yeah. longest time since the Industrial Revolution. That's absolutely incredible. So coal produces more CO2 than any other type of fossil fuel when we're talking about electricity generation. Obviously, there's a pecking order when it comes to who, what do we choose first in terms of electricity, and renewables are up there. But renewables now are much more efficient beasts. They um, produce, they cost less to install, and there's more of them. So obviously, it means that we can take our pick, and we are choosing those. There's also the, the low carbon alternatives like nuclear, which is always there sort of as a constant, mm. uh, just simmering on. Because obviously when there's no wind and no sunlight, we need to get our uh, electricity from somewhere else. So the fact that there's no coal is, is a brilliant takeaway. And what that means going into post COVID and post lockdown, where there's lots of lessons we can learn, but certainly the memory of the clear skies, the memory of the fact that renewables are out there and it's producing inexpensive and clean electricity for us is a, so much a takeaway, it really is, and something which we really need to hold on to and pressurise the government to just push through with this Green New Deal, which means that, you know, life is going to be better for generations to come.